The Cold War refers to the years between 1947 and 1991 when the United States and Russia, then called the USSR, were locked in a disagreement of ideas and beliefs. The USSR was a communist country. Communism is a form of government that closely dictates the rights and freedoms of its citizens. Communism outlaws the choice of religion, freedom of speech, and the right to bear arms. Petitioning the government, organizing community meetings, or printing your own newspaper is illegal. Citizens can be arrested without cause, and police can search homes for no reason. The democracy of the United States, as dictated in the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, is the opposite of communism. As the USSR wanted to spread communism throughout the world and the United States wanted to promote freedom, tension grew between the two countries. Each built up its military force. This included the production of nuclear weapons. Many people feared hostilities would grow and the two countries would begin fighting and launch World War III. As more countries adopted freedoms like the United States, similarly countries joined the communist movement. One country, Germany, was split in its loyalties. Eastern Germany wanted communism, while Western Germany chose democracy. Because of this, in 1961, the USSR built a huge concrete wall through the middle of Berlin, Germany. This was called the Berlin Wall. It prevented those in the East from leaving communist Germany and moving to democratic Western Germany. U.S. and USSR government leaders spent many years trying to work out their differences without causing a bloody war. Finally, U.S. President Ronald Reagan and Communist leader Mikhail Gorbachev signed a treaty that ended the Cold War. The Berlin Wall was torn down in 1990. Communism ended in Russia and a friendly relationship began between the two biggest world powers, the United States and Russia. So that was the Cold War. A little background, of course, video, of course, talking about what that was, of course, between the United States, of course, and the Soviet Union. So anyway, I hope you are having a great afternoon out there. Uh, this is Daniel Simon, of course, at Baton Rouge Community College. Uh, so it looks like we've got a few students watching live right now. Uh, looks like Ross is up there right now again. Of course, Tony, hey, what's going on? Hope you're doing great out there. And of course, Jennifer's also watching. So if you're having a great afternoon, pretty much uh, in in the world. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, this week, of course, and next week, I'll be, of course, mostly talking about the Cold War era, uh, you know, up through post-War War II era, which is what we're talking about right now, because we pretty much finished up World War II the other day. Uh, so uh, anyway, um, before I get started, just a few announcements, of course, right now. Uh, I think as of now, y'all have got the uh, second exam, I believe, that's still out right now. So that's the main thing, of course, y'all need to wrap up. I think that's due, I want to say, Friday, uh, which is uh, looks like April 23rd. So try to get that wrapped up. Uh, and uh, depending on which, which class you're in, you know, because I think I'm lecturing pretty much for both American classes right now because we're pretty much on the home front trying to finish. But um, I think you had the book of the research papers that were due. So uh, I think I know the 12 weeks class, it was due the other day, but seven weeks classes, I believe it's due this Friday. So uh, I'll still, of course, take those if they're late. No problem. I'll get those graded. So just send me those to me. You can just you know upload the speed grader or like in Canvas or if you know not do that, you can email me, of course, if you want to as well. So. Anyway, yeah, like the remaining, you know, lecture material pretty much this week and next week is going to be pretty much towards y'all's final, which I think in the final is going to be mostly, um, I guess, World War II to the present, like whatever we pretty much get in. Um, and I don't know how far I'm going to get, you know, this week and next week. Uh, maybe I'll get up to the 1980s and 90s maybe, but that might be it. We'll see about that, how that goes. Uh, I know today I'll be talking about mostly the Truman uh, Eisenhower era, which is, you know, mostly happens in, from, I guess, the late 1940s to uh, the 1950s. So I'll kind of get into that uh, today, uh, talk mostly about the Cold War, because the Cold War kind of peaks in the 1950s and the 
1960. So if you have any questions, comments, you know, later, let me know uh, either during the live broadcast or a bunch of you usually send me some kind of comments, questions later, of course, through my channel. No big deal, of course. So uh, from last class, of course, last lecture, I had talked about uh, the end of World War II. You know how, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union were the only big superpowers left. And that's what kind of caused the Cold War uh, to occur. And of course, I went through uh, different, you know, reasons why the Cold War happened. Uh, I think it kind of goes back to the time when the, I told you the Soviet Union formed. Uh, there was a lot of mistrust, you know, towards communism. It's part of why the fascists were around because they didn't like the communists either, uh, that kind of deal. Uh, then I'll tell you how they occupied Germany uh, after the war. Uh, they divided it up, and that was another cause of it, too. Uh, communism also spread into Asia uh, as well. Uh, the United Nations also formed after the war, which created a lot of problems, too, tensions between the Eastern Bloc and Western Bloc countries. And so that had a lot to do with it uh, also as well. So uh, one of the first things I'm going to really talk about today uh, is really kind of continuing with the Truman administration. We, we need to talk about uh, the so-called Truman Doctrine, of course, that develops later. I'll kind of get into that first and I'll also talk about the, um, I think of the other thing they have too that's big uh, is the uh, Marshall Plan. I'll get into both of those and mention a little bit about it. But uh, the Truman Doctrine was something that Truman issued in 1947. It was a new foreign policy uh, that came out. And the idea, by the way, uh, was to try and contain communism, to prevent it from spreading. Uh, it's already spread already, like into Eastern Europe. Uh, and so there's this fear that it's going to keep spreading all over the world. Every country is communist. Uh, and so that was the point of this. And uh, I don't know if you know much about this, but the brainchild, uh, the containment policy, you know, the Truman Doctrine, was a man named George Keenan, uh, who was an American diplomat. He was, in fact, he was an expert on the Soviet Union. I think he'd been like a diplomat uh, in the Soviet Union. And he's the one who advocated for it to get this, you know, new policy put into place. Uh, and um, it was also a foreign policy, by the way, uh, that influenced a lot of the, the so-called wise men uh, that they were called. The wise men were these various officials, politicians, and so on, uh, that were really in uh, Truman's and Eisenhower's administration that affected a lot of the policies that later developed, such as the Marshall Plan, uh, the NATO, uh, the World Food Bank, things like that. Uh, Dean Acheson, Secretary of State, probably one of the most influential also early on. Uh, that's important with that as well. So um, so that was the first thing. Uh, also, the United States, how, part of how it got started, I don't know if you know much about this, but uh, these two countries, which were uh, Greece and Turkey, were being threatened by communist uprisings. Uh, and so uh, the United States in 1947 decided to intervene to try to help those countries out because uh, they were worried about them going communist. And so that led to the so-called Marshall Plan being developed uh, in the late 1940s, uh, put in place, you can see, from 1948 uh, to 1951. And uh, it was originally called the Economic Recovery Plan. And the United States would go on to spend something like 12 to $13 billion uh, to help out uh, Western Europe to get back on their feet uh, and rebuild uh, after World War II. Uh, and uh, it was called Marshall Plan, by the way, uh, for George C. Marshall, who, by the way, was the Secretary of State, I think later after Atchison, I think it was a little later, Atchison, I think, stepped down and he came in. Marshall was a um, famous uh, American general in World War II. In fact, he had the chief of staff of under FDR. The guy planned everything pretty much in the war. And um, he won the Nobel Prize for it. And, of course, they got named after him. Uh, and... Um, the actual Marshall Plan didn't just rebuild a lot of your Western countries like Britain and France and all that, uh, but it also helped us to prevent the spread of communism. That was the whole point, I think, why they did it. Uh, but um, also helped Germany. Uh, there was a lot of starvation. 
uh, in Germany after the war. Uh, and so that's part of also why they put it in as well. Uh, so um, they offered it to the Soviet Union. I don't know if you know this, not in a lot of Eastern Bloc countries, but Stalin refused to take it, any of our money, you know, that. so maybe that's good. <laughs> um, now, uh, the big, big thing, of course, they always talk about that really caused the East split thing to occur, occur if you know about, was the so-called, um, they had the Berlin blockade uh, and, of course, the so-called uh, airlift that they had. I don't think I've got a picture of the blockade, but I do got a picture of the airlift and all that, so-called Berlin airlift and all that that occurred. And what happened was in 1948, uh, Joseph Stalin decided to blockade Berlin. Uh, the reason why is he wanted to get the Western powers, Britain, France, United States, uh, out of West Berlin, because remember, Berlin was divided uh, between the Western and Eastern powers uh, and all that. And so the West responded with this so-called Berlin airlift, which uh, I think went from like July 1948 uh, to May of 1949, about 10 months uh, the West did all these different sorties uh, to try to save West Berlin uh, from being taken over. Uh, and uh, they flew something like 200,000 sorties, by the way, uh, to, to deliver, you can see, close to something like 4 million tons of aid. Uh, that's, by the way, equivalent to almost flying like, they said, 92 million square miles, 92 million miles, which is like a lot. Uh, and um, the um, Ber the Berlin blockade was important. Uh, it's one of the things that really creates the whole east-west divide, uh, where we don't trust them anymore. Uh, and so it ends up causing, you know, east and west Berlin to, to form. In 1949, they create their own separate states, like we talked about before. And then, um, and then also it ends up creating NATO uh, as well. Uh, so-called North Atlantic Treaty Organizations formed uh, after that. Uh, and um, this is, of course, NATO still around. NATO originally was formed to basically uh, prevent uh, being invaded by the Soviets. It was a fear that the Soviet Union was going to basically invade Western Europe, you know, I guess West Germany to France, whatever, kind of like the Nazis, whatever. And so uh, that's why it formed initially. Uh, and so currently you can see that 30 countries are about in it uh, today. Um, the actual headquarters of NATO, by the way, is in Brussels, Belgium. That's where it is. And um, I think they have like a supreme commander. They have like its own forces, you know, NATO forces uh, with a supreme allied commander, I think is what they call it. So I think the first supreme allied commander was Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, a lot of them were American generals. Uh, they were poor, part of this organization. Uh, where are the states? By the way, I think I had a map showing that right here. But most of the states in NATO, uh, besides the United States and Canada, uh, are like, you know, Spain, France. You can see Belgium, Britain, West Germany, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Norway. Of course, now, now Germany. I think Poland's in it now, I believe. Yeah. And a bunch of other states. Uh, so that's that's the number that are, of course, there. And I guess NATO is now this alliance that, I guess, uh, opposes um, really Russia now. You know, so I guess if Russia were to attack NATO, you might have a big war uh, break out. So in a sense, it was kind of developed to prevent basically like a World War III, but it could have caused World War III if, say, the Soviets would attack one of those Western Bloc countries. That's what they usually call it. Like a lot of the NATO states are part of the so-called Western Bloc. And then um, you also had like the Soviets had their own alliance. They formed later. You probably heard of called the Warsaw Pact, uh, which you can see in this picture, this map again, you can see all the red areas are, are basically where the Eastern Bloc or uh, Warsaw Pact countries were. And I'll put them on the screen for you who they were, but there's like eight of them. Soviet Union, East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, and Albania uh, were all in it. Uh, and so, so you got these two alliances. So obviously, you know, these two alliances could have caused World War III, you know, if they would have attacked each other and stuff like that. But 
lot of these states, like you see in Eastern Europe, are kind of like almost like satellite states of the Soviets because they practically controlled them politically and so on. Uh, let me also move, move on to talk about um, Harry S. Truman. Uh, now, Harry S. Truman, uh, by the way, ran for re-election. Here, of course, is Truman right here. He, of course, would win in 1948. Um, ran for re-election in a very, by the way, contested election. He almost did win. It was a very close election. Uh, of course, the 34th president for Missouri. And uh, he ran against actually three men. Three men ran in 1948 for the presidency. You had, the, of course, the two main ones were Harry S. Truman, of course, I told you from Missouri, uh, the Democrat, and then Thomas Dewey, who was the governor of New York, ran as the Republican nominee. Uh, so you have those two right there, Dewey versus Truman. Uh, and, um, and they actually had one more that, that ran, too, uh, who was interesting. That was Strom Thurmond. You may have heard of him. Uh, who was from South Carolina. He had been a previously a governor, and I think now he's a senator. And uh, he ran under what is called the Dixiecrat Party, uh, which was this pro-segregationist -segre uh, white supremacist kind of party uh, that opposed a lot of Truman's ideas. Like the Democrats were talking about putting a civil rights platform uh, in their, in their, um, you know, their party platform. Uh, and then if you know about it, uh, Truman in July of 1948 had, had desegregated the military. So they started doing. Uh, and so uh, the Dixiecrats uh, got a lot of white Southerners uh, to basically join it. And so that's that's pretty much where you see a lot of, you know, uh, white Southerners starting to leave uh, the Demo Democrat Party. And they start, you know, going more towards the Republican Party. It's something that's going to really happen you know, from, I guess, the 1950s up to like the 1980s or whatever, which is going to take like 30 years or so of uh, this to go on. But eventually what's, what it's going to do, it's going to weaken that so-called solid South, you know, that where the Democrats had controlled the South for years, uh, which not anymore. Uh, and so when you get like Reagan, Ronald Reagan, all he's going to win over a lot of, you know, so white, white, white Southerners, whatever. And that's right, really what Nixon, Nixon really started it. Uh, initially, you know, with that, uh, but it's going to start more or less doing that. Part of why that happened, by the way, was because a lot of African Americans who were in the Republican Party, they switched to the Democratic Party. So a lot of your white Southerners then switched from the Democrat to the Republican Party. So it's kind of kind of reversed or whatever with what they did. Uh, but Truman won, by the way, in an upset. He upset Thomas Dewey. The media, the newspapers, and all that. Uh, thought that Truman would lose. And of course, if you know about it, there was a famous newspaper that was printed by the Chicago Daily, Daily Tribune that said, Dewey defeats Truman, you see, you know. Uh, and so that's basically what happened. Um, I think the same thing happened with Clinton 2016. They had a bunch of magazines printed where it said, Madame President, and she lost. It's kind of like that, I guess. It's not similar. But uh, one thing that Truman did, he promised when he was running for election for, in 1949, if he got elected again, reelected, he had this thing called the Fair Deal uh, that he promised to the American people, which is it's a bunch of domestic policy ideas that he was kind of pushing, which was, I think, kind of a continuation of the New Deal is what it was. And these are all the things that were kind of part of it. I'll kind of put on the screen here, but he promised to give more aid to education. This is going to be something important too, by the way, during the Cold War, because I think when Sputnik happens in 1957, we start realizing that we're behind. We're behind the, you know, the Soviets and all this technology, technologically wise, whatever. So they, they need more emphasis on like, you know, math, science and things like that. And that's something people start doing. Also college, you know, as well. Universal health insurance, believe it or not, was something they kind of pushed, which I don't think it ever happened. Uh, Fair Employment Practices Commission, I think, was set up with something they came up with. And he wanted to repeal the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act, which was this act that they were trying to restrict labor unions, but um, which they kind of, I think it kind of, they kind of relaxed that later, but it was something that was kind of, some of the things he was kind of pushing for uh, that he was talking about. But, after Truman came in, uh, the big thing that they started talking about instead was not not domestic issues, but 
more like foreign policy issues like with the Cold War, and then also fear that there were people in the country that were radical, that were like communist, et cetera. And uh, of course, the big thing that happened, you know, uh, in, in that period, late 40s, uh, nine, early 1950s, you start getting all these things with like, you know, the whole communism thing start coming in, like the Alger Hess case, uh, the Rosenbergs uh, and all that. And so you get this fear of communism, a so-called second red scare uh, happens because uh, there's the fear that communism is starting to take over the world. Uh, in Europe, Asia, uh, there's a fear that communism is going to take over the United States. People are paranoid about this uh, in the late 1940s uh, and early 1950s. And you can understand why. You had things like these are examples right here I'll kind of give you. But uh, the Soviet Union got the atomic bomb. 1948. They tested the first atomic bomb, 1949. So within just you know four years after we blew up ours, they had theirs. Uh, late within three years, both had the hydrogen bomb by 1952. On top of that, yeah. Uh, then China and North Korea both became communist. So you got that going on uh, also as well. And then of course the big thing that happened, you know, in in the 19 late 40s, early 1950s. Uh, was the Truman administration began investigating people for being communists. This is something that they did uh, quite a lot. And, of course, they're talking about right there uh, this issue with the Alger Hiss case. That was one of the first cases that really came out uh, that was around 1950. And what happened was in 1949, there was a guy named Whitaker Chambers who had been, by the way, a former member of the American Communist Party. I guess he had left it. I always thought a communist is always a communist, though. <laughs> but um, anyway, he came forward and said that Alger Hiss, who had worked in the U.S. State Department, was a Soviet spy. Uh, and so uh, there was this deal where they found a bunch of microfilm uh, in a pumpkin. It was left, I think, I think it was like left at his door or something like that. And uh, it was called the Pumpkin Papers or something like that. And so he was eventually uh, put in front of a grand jury. Uh, where he committed perjury, uh, apparently. And uh, if you know about this, um, he was investigated by this new committee that formed that was called the House of Un-American Activities Committee, sometimes called HUAC for, for short. Uh, and it was uh, controlled by the House of Representatives in the U.S. Congress. And what it did was it began investigating people for being communists or having ties to communism. Uh, and... Um, if you know about it, many people would go before this committee, and one of the things that they would do is they would plead the Fifth Amendment. They would say, are you a communist? I plead the Fifth. You know any communists? I plead the Fifth. <laughs> the Fifth. Or something would say joking. I think Chappelle made fun of that or something about that. But um, anyway, um, yeah, a lot of people got banned. They got blackballed. Like they had like a bunch of Hollywood directors, if you know about this, that were famous, that made movies. They couldn't make movies anymore on uh, things like that. Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer supposedly at one point may have joined like, I think one of the socialist parties or something like that. He lost his security clearance or something like that uh, because of that issue uh, also as well. So a lot of people couldn't get employment afterwards uh, because of that. You can see Richard Nixon was heavily involved with that from California. He was a very anti-communist, uh, by the way. So was John F. Kennedy. He was also a very anti-communist, as well as a senator uh, in Congress at that time. Uh, then they got this other thing that's real famous. You probably heard about the Rosenbergs, of course, were well known uh, during the same time period. Uh, they were accused and convicted of spying for the Soviet Union, led the so-called Rosenbergs trial uh, in 1951. Uh, and supposedly what happened was, uh, I think I think what it was is Julius Rosenberg at one point, had, I think it worked at Los Alamos and uh, they had gotten some kind of military secrets from uh, uh, Ethel's brother, uh, whose name was David Greenglass. Uh, and uh, anyway, they, they, they were found out uh, and what happened was they were found guilty of it, 1951. And if you know about 1953, uh, Sing Sing Prison, which is in New York, they were executed, uh, both of them in the electric chair. 
uh, both Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Now at the same time, I wonder about that. Uh, and uh, Ethel Rosenberg, by the way, was the last woman to be uh, executed via electric chair. I don't know if they ever had anybody else electric. Uh, you know, I'm sure, there's been people put to death otherwise, maybe lethal injection, maybe a woman, but I think she's the last woman to be uh, basically executed that way. And her execution didn't go well. You, you study about it, uh, but. Anyway, um, so yeah, that, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. And then they also had, don't forget, uh, as well, they had Joseph McCarthy on top of that, uh, who came in next uh, in the early 1950s, from about 1950 to 54. Uh, McCarthy, he was a senator uh, from what is Wisconsin, a Republican. He basically began this witch hunt uh, against communists uh, that were in the country. And uh, it became famous because it was on TV, like, you know, pretty much showing all these people uh, getting grilled uh, on whether they were communist or not. And so it led to that term you may have heard about. Uh, they start using, of course, in American history, which they start using the term McCarthyism uh, to describe, uh, the, the, I guess, the witch hunt that it was kind of kind of seen as uh, by people in the government or people in the media uh, and all that in McCarthy was heavily demonized uh, because he would often use like smear campaigns or uh, they say even use false accusations against people. Uh, and uh, he was also a drunk. He had like, like a drinking problem and was kind of an alcoholic and eventually died young in 1954 uh, because of his drinking. But the weird thing about uh, McCarthy is that he has been vindicated. It's something that, that most people don't know about. Uh, but apparently, uh, by af when after the Cold War ended, uh, they discovered that in some of the Soviet archives uh, that there were spies in the U.S. government that were there. That you know that McCarthy was some of the stuff he was talking about was actually true uh, about this. Maybe his methods were kind of you know too far, uh, they think. Uh, but um, but basically, yeah, there were spies in the government for sure, and probably today there are. I'm sure there are spies uh, that are in the government. They're still spying on us from various countries, Russia, you know, Iran and China uh, that, that are there. that are spying on us right now. Probably right now, watching this right now. <laughs> so, yeah, so that kind of thing. Um, all right, so you have that. Uh, then, of course, the other thing, of course, that happened, of course, I'll talk about uh, as well uh, that occurred. Yeah, China. As you know, China uh, goes communist as well. Uh, in 1949. That's, a, of course, a big thing. You see Mao Zedong. Uh, he, of course, was the founder of what we call the People's Republic uh, of China, uh, and um, which, of course, capital, of course, at, at what is uh, Beijing. Uh, and as you know, uh, at that time, uh, the Chinese communists were fighting the Republican forces of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, they were involved in what they call the Chinese Civil War, uh, and what eventually happened was that the um, the um, Chiang Kai-shek side lost. We were kind of busy with our own problems because of the Cold War, and we forgot about what was going on in China, uh, and so the next thing you know, uh, they're pushed out. Basically, Chiang Kai-shek has run out, uh, basically, uh, and he's forced to basically um, live on Taiwan, uh, is what it is, and so for a long time, uh, the United States refused to recognize the People's Republic of China as being China. Back, back in, I think, for a few years of the UN, uh, the actual representative of China was Taiwan, uh, which was called, I think, Taiwan ROC or something like that. Uh, now it's not, but that's, of course, a big controversy today still because uh, we still su support Taiwan, uh, as you know. And um, Mao Zedong was kind of controversial. Uh, he would actually convert all of China uh, into communism. He had what they called Maoism, which was kind of like this peasant version of communism. Because I think with the traditional communism, like in, say, Soviet Union, it was more of a workers' revolution. It's more like a peasants' revolution, more like it. And uh, from there, he actually created what they call the Great Leap Forward, where he would try to uh, start in the 1950s. Uh, he would try to um, industrialize China to make it into a world power, uh, like the Soviets did. And if you know about it, it led to like this mass starvation uh, in China where millions died. 
uh, which they're not sure how many people died in China, but I think there's something they say he may have killed like something like 30, 40 million people uh, in some of these changes he made to China. And he had this cultural revolution, I think that was later, which was I think in the 1960s that they also had, uh, where they tried to stamp out anybody that was not communist. Uh, you know, because of the fact that China went communist, you know, North Korea went communist, things like that, uh, people start thinking, you know, that there's this so-called domino theory that they have. That becomes real popular in the 1950s and 1960s. And that was a belief that if a certain area went communist, like in, say, Asia or somewhere else, that basically it would spread like a domino effect, you know, where topple over each country. And this is something that is, that's really, you know, was very, very popular dealing with Asia. It's part of why we got into the Korean War. It's part of why we got in the Vietnam War, because uh, we were trying to prevent the spread of communism, you know, throughout that region. That's what I wanted to talk about today uh, as well, uh, which is important, uh, which we, we need to get into the so-called Korean conflict. Of course, that happened next. That was, you know, big uh, that occurs. Uh, and that's really the big, big, I guess, event that happened in the early, first real big event really in the 1950s uh, was the was the Korean War uh, that occurred. And uh, the Korean conflict was like an example of basically the Cold War heating up. It was kind of like this proxy war. Uh, you can call it where you had communists fighting, you know, non-communists. Uh, and you got, you know, basically North Korea backed by China, Soviet Union, and then you've got South Korea backed by the United States and other democratic capitalist countries uh, overall. Why did it happen? Why did the Korean War happen? Well, a lot of it, if you go to, I guess, a picture of showing like maybe kind of a map, I guess, of uh, the Korean Peninsula right here. Uh, before, uh, you know, going back to World War II, the country that had controlled Korea had been Japan. They had controlled it. However, when the war ended, they withdrew. Uh, and so what happened was Soviet Union came in in the United States, and they created these two opposing states. They had one called North Korea, you can see, which was created by the Soviets. And then you had South Korea that was created by the United States uh, that you had. And they had different names, like the official names that they actually called them. Like North Korea's real name is actually the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. That's actually, they called it, you know, capital at Young Yang, of course. You can see it was founded in 1948. And then the other state uh, is called Republic of Korea, which everybody calls it South Korea founded the same year, 1948. Seoul, of course, it's capital uh, today. Uh, and you can see also they had different rulers, like Sigmund Rhee was the first president of South Korea. You've probably heard of uh, Kim Il-sung. Kim Il-sung, of course, uh, was the founding father of North Korea. Uh, he, of course, is, as you know, the grandfather of the current ruler, Kim Kim Jong Un, it's a typo. Kim Jong Kim, yeah, Kim Jong Jong Un, I get that name right. Uh, who, of course, is the current ruler. I guess he's still alive. Uh, and um, yeah, Kim Jong Un is his name. And um, anyway, um, they believe that part of why the Korean War happened is really because of the Soviet Union. Uh, by the way, uh, here is the um, you can see here in this map. Uh, the two states were divided at the 38th parallel. So right here, not quite, but you can see where the DMZ is now uh, between the two states. But that that's originally where they basically divided the two up uh, between the two powers. Now, like I said, what caused the war to break out, the Korean War, was because of Stalin. Stalin uh, kind of uh, thought that, that South Korea was a weaker state uh, compared to North Korea. In fact, the, the Soviets had given the uh, North Koreans military equipment, uh, basically, to, to you know, defend their state. And so they thought that they could easily conquer the southern part, like South Korea, and make it into one, one Korean state, uh, which would be, of course, communist. And so that, that's pretty much the reason why, you know, 
the whole thing happened. And so what, what occurred was in uh, about June of 1950, uh, what occurred was that the North Koreans uh, invaded South Korea, which you can see here. I think it shows initially the first advance uh, into, um, I think it's right here. They pushed down right here, which is an orange right there first, uh, which they would push down to the bottom of, of what is South Korea uh, here. And uh, so, yeah, the, the North Koreans routed uh, the South Koreans, taking their capital of Seoul. They drove, you can see, all the way down to the bottom, South Korea, where uh, Pusan is, the city of Pusan uh, on the Sea of Japan. Uh, and uh, it created this um, pocket or perimeter. I think called the Pusan perimeter, I think is what they called it, basically. And so what happened was the UN came in. If you know about this, the UN intervened. Uh, to help out Korea uh, in the Korean conflict. And so the United States put up a majority of the forces. I think we had like 90% of the actual forces uh, were put up uh, to fight with the South Koreans uh, to intervene. Uh, and, of course, Douglas MacArthur, who was, by the way, involved with the occupation of Japan after the war, was brought in uh, to basically uh, fight. Uh, lead lead the troops in battle, uh, and uh, what happened was it led to a famous uh, amphibious invasion of Korea called the Battle of Incheon, which if you go back to that map right here, uh, the U.S. did an amphibious attack uh, from the Yellow Sea right here uh, on the west coast of, of where South Korea is. Uh, they attacked that in September 1950, and they retook Seoul, took it back. Uh, and so uh, this caused the whole uh, North Korean force that was down here uh, to kind of collapse and then retreat back to the north, uh, which which they would be forced to do uh, at that point. Uh, and um, by the way, the operation I was talking about, uh, about Incheon was was called Operation Chromite, if you want the original name. I don't know if you have to know that. That's what they originally called it. And it was considered a, a genius move uh, by MacArthur uh, right there. But what happened was the UN forces, uh, I think, went too far. They, if you know about it, they kept going up into the northern part of North Korea. Uh, they took the capital of Yongyang, and then from there they pushed toward the Chinese-North Korean border just about. Uh, and at that point, China kind of got angry about this because it was, you know, close to their border. And so the Chinese entered the war, like around November, December of 1950. That caused the basically the UN force to be driven back down the peninsula and even past the 38th parallel. Uh, there would be a deal uh, where um, the actual North Korean Chinese side would actually retake Seoul again, and they have to take it back <laughs> in 19, I think, 51. Uh, so it kind of went back and forth, kind of seesawing back and forth uh, between both sides. Uh, the Americans fought some horrible battles, by the way, up in the northern part of, of North Korea. You may have heard of the Battle of Chosin Reservoir uh, that was famous. They had a so-called gauntlet battle where they had to run this gauntlet, basically, where they were attacked on all sides. Uh, by Chinese, and so it became a massive retreat. Uh, and I think there was one general that said, "Why are you retreating?" And he said, uh, "We're just in, uh, uh, we're just advancing in a different direction, or something like that." Is what they said. And I think the survivors of Chosin were called the Chosen Few, C H O S I N. You know, so yeah. And North Korea, that was uh, fighting North Korea and China during the Korean War was very difficult. The terrain was horrible. Uh, like you have a lot of mountainous terrain uh, throughout Korea. And uh, the war would drag on. It was a stalemate. Neither side could really win uh, the war. And uh, we suffered something like 54,000 men that were killed in the war, which is just in three years. So can you imagine it was like Vietnam dragging on for 10 years? Uh, the amount of men uh, that would have died uh, in the war would be like 200,000 or something like that would have been the, would have been the amount. Uh, by the way, uh, one thing that's very famous that happened in 1951 in the Korean War, uh, MacArthur, if you know about it, was fired by Harry S. Truman uh, for insubordination. 
uh, not following directions, I guess, from the presidency. And uh, part of it was the fact that um, MacArthur was thinking of using nuclear weapons on the Chinese because they had you know, come into the war at that point. Uh, and um, at that point, you know, it was kind of not sure who should control, you know, nuclear weapons. Should it be the president who should have the you know, final decision? Or can it be like a general who's, who's in the battlefield and like, hey, bring out the nuclear weapons and we'll drop it on them over there. <laughs> that kind of deal. I guess it was kind of like he was thinking that, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, I think uh, Truman flew all the way to Wake Island to meet with him and had him fired. Uh, and all that. And uh, the firing of MacArthur, by the way, was very unpopular. The American people and the press were not happy. with Truman was not a popular president, even though he got reelected. A lot of people didn't like him uh, and all that. Uh, and um, But um, I think MacArthur wanted to be president to himself. I think he was thinking of running in 1952 uh, as well. And uh, MacArthur is the one that made that farewell address in front of Congress uh, which I think maybe people have probably heard of before, where he said that old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Uh, and Truman, who didn't really like MacArthur, said he was a bunch of bullshit, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> so uh, actually, the Korean War did not end until 1953. Uh, in fact, Eisenhower is the one that pretty much uh, would kind of help to get it ended. Uh, he would kind of force, I guess, both sides to kind of form an armistice, but neither side actually formed, signed a treaty that actually ended the war. So uh, the Korean War really never ended. It's still kind of ongoing. Uh, they still have a demilitarized zone uh, between you know, North Korea and South Korea. And of course, as you know, there's a lot of American soldiers that are manned there uh, along the 38th parallel, I think usually, I think we have some over there, I thought, along with the North, I thought with the South North Koreans and all that. I think we've got some. Oh, usually, I think that's true about that. So, anyway, so yeah, that's pretty much the whole Truman era. I want to go ahead and, of course, move on to talk about also uh, the Eisenhower era. I'll get into that next. Here's, of course, a thing showing, of course, Truman, you know, firing uh, Eisenhower uh, and all that. Yeah, excuse me, excuse me, yeah, excuse me, Truman firing MacArthur and all that. So, yeah, let me get to and talk about Ike. Uh, we'll get to him next of course, uh, which is Eisenhower. Yeah, Dwight Eisenhower. He, of course, um, he would run in 1952. Truman, by the way, could have run again. I don't think he would have got elected, though. Uh, Korean War was kind of unpopular, which is part of why I think he didn't get elected either. It's kind of like one of these wars that nobody really wanted to fight. Nobody knew where Korea was. Uh, and see, a 22nd Amendment, had just been passed, 50, 1951. So, uh, you know, you can only have two term limits as president, but Truman was exempt because he had been elected before that. So he could have run another time, uh, but he decided not to. But uh, Eisenhower uh, would eventually run for president. New Eisenhower, as you know, uh, was a famous, you know, general in World War II, of course, for involved with D-Day. Uh, and, of course, he pretty much, ran as the Republican nominee. I think MacArthur, like I said, wanted to run, but Eisenhower is more popular. And he ran on a slogan. You can see which was, it's time for a change. And he ran with uh, Richard Nixon, who was kind of an ar um, ardent communist, uh, who was in, in the, the senator in the Congress uh, from California. He was his VP. Uh, and um, so he was the one that really, you know, um, would do that. And uh, Eisenhower would run against this guy named Adley Stevenson, who had, was governor of Illinois uh, at the time. Uh, he, of course, was famous for running for president multiple times. I think he ran in 1952 and 1956. He also campaigned in 1960 as well, uh, Stevenson. Uh, Stevenson was also a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations in the 1960s. We'll talk about him later. Uh, he's the one that's like the ambassador when they have the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. I'll get to that later because it's a famous thing he kind of does at that time that's well known. Uh, and um, Stevenson was famous for uh, being one of the first politicians uh, that showed the bottom of his shoes. It was like one of his slogans he kind of ran on uh, where, you know, elect me, my shoes are all worn out. He has like, holes in the bottom of his shoe. Have you ever seen that? Uh, and uh, you see, I'm a working man, you know, vote for me, uh, that kind of thing. But 
Uh, Eisenhower, um, he was just too popular. Uh, people didn't really want the Democrats anymore, I think, because of what happened under Truman with the Korean War, et cetera. And so, um, and Ike then ran on this slogan you see there, which was, I like Ike. Ike is for us. We like Ike, things like that. Uh, and they even had buttons and TV ads and things like that. And that helped to eventually propel him to a landslide victory, of course, over Adlai Stevenson, who, by the way, he beat twice in 1952 and also in 1956. Uh, I remember my dad telling me this. It's pretty, my dad's 86, I think is correct. He, I think his first uh, president here voted for was Adlai Stevenson in uh, 1956. Uh, and, and of course, he lost. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think back then he had to be 21 to vote instead of 18. All right. Um, now, um, let me go ahead and, of course, move on. Uh, I'm going to, of course, talk about some of the things that, of course, happened under Ike, you know, that were pretty big, Eisenhower's administration. Of course, you've got this continuation, uh, you know, uh, of basically the, the Cold War going on, which, you know, we'll, of course, talk about the 1950s uh, and all that. Uh, and um, the biggest thing that really happened that was a, like a change with the policies uh, with the Cold War, like foreign policy, uh, was uh, this guy named John Foster Dulles, who was the new Secretary of State, when Eisenhower came up with this new policy called brinkmanship, uh, which they start, started using in the 1950s. It was a new way to counter communism. And so instead of trying to contain it, uh, one of the things that they started doing, uh, I guess they were still trying to contain it, but uh, what they were trying to do is they wanted to basically build up their 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 military, the armed forces, uh, nuclear weapon stockpiles. Uh, and uh, basically uh, what they wanted to do is they, Dulles believed that the use of threat of nuclear war with the Soviets could be used to prevent nuclear war. Now, that sounds crazy, right, to do this. Uh, but there was an idea where they thought that, you know, if we build up these massive stockpile of nuclear weapons, the other side's not going to want to use it because if we do, you know what's going to happen. The world will be fried. Everybody will be dead. Uh, and uh, I think they call this later uh, mutual assured destruction, MAD, as they called it, uh, which that would be assured if both sides retaliated uh, with nuclear weapons uh, and all that. And so, you know, by that time, by 1952, 53, like I said, I told you, both sides had the hydrogen bomb. Uh, and so that's pretty scary. So hydrogen bomb is way more powerful. I think it was like a thousand times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, something like that. Uh, so that's something that, you know, obviously we don't want to use, uh, which could still happen, but hopefully it never does. Uh, then the other thing that happened, which is very famous uh, after um, Eisenhower came in, uh, as you know, uh, Joseph Stalin died. Uh, and they had this new new uh, leader of the Soviet Union that came in, of course, who was Nikita Khrushchev, uh, who you see right there. Uh, Khrushchev, of course, uh, went back to Stalin's time. Uh, in fact, he had been under Stalin going back to World War II. I think he was one of the guys that helped, helped Stalin win. Uh, he wasn't a general, but I think he was a commissar uh, that was under Stalin at the Battle of Stalingrad and all that, which is famous. Uh, and um, some of you call him Stalin Light, or I kind of joke about that. And But uh, what happened was Khrushchev came in, and what he, what he did was he started this thing called destalinization. Uh, where they basically denounce Stalin's policies, uh, which have been, you know, really hardliner type policies, uh, the cult of personality, all those policies where they had repressed people, put people in prison or, or gulags, things like that. So all that, all that was dubbed the so-called Khrushchev fall, I think is what some people called it uh, later on. Uh, where they began to relax all these repressive issues that were in the Soviet Union. So uh, you can see they started emptying all the gulags out uh, starting in the 19, uh, pretty much in the 1950s and 60s. They start doing this uh, overall. Uh, there's even a case where they start trying to make peace with foreign countries, uh, meet with different foreign powers, 
uh, things like that. Uh, and I'll get to it later, but in 1959, as you know, Joseph um, uh, Nikita Khrushchev visited the United States to try to kind of smooth over differences between the two powers and all that, which worked for a while, but I'll talk about it later in the early 60s. Things get kind of tense uh, for a few few different reasons. So, yeah, that's it right there. You know, the so-called Khrushchev fall, of course, that would happen. Uh, but he was just maybe a little bit better than Stalin. <laughs> you know, he's in power from, I think, 1953 uh, to about 1964. But we'll talk about him further. He is famous for going to the UN, if you know about that, and taking off a shoe and banging it on the desk and saying, we will bury you. I have heard of that uh, before. Um, now, of course, uh, some of the issues that uh, Eisenhower dealt with, by the way, uh, was there's a bunch of things happened, like after destalinization occurred. Uh, you may have heard about the Hungarian Revolution, which occurred around October to November of 1956. Well, because of the fact that destalinization occurred, parts of Eastern Europe, you start to see more states like Poland and so on getting more rights. Uh, and so like more freedoms and things like that. And so what is Budapest? You have like college students that actually started kind of rebel against the government. And so the Hungarians create this huge uh, nationwide revolution uh, that occurs, which is the Hungarians uh, People's Republic basically rebels uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, against all their different policies. And for about 13 days, it looked like they were going to overthrow uh, the Soviets, you know, imposed policies uh, that were in the country. In fact, I think for a short time, uh, there was a deal uh, where they actually pushed out the Soviet government. Uh, and, um, and then Khrushchev realized that if they don't, uh, what's going to happen is that this whole revolution will spread. It will go into other countries uh, Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia, and so on. Uh, and so uh, what happened was the Soviet military went back in uh, and they crushed it. And they think over 3,000 people were killed uh, putting down the Hungarian revolution. And um, the Hungarians kept getting on like the radio and trying to radio the West uh, for aid. Uh, just hopefully for us, maybe the Americans or some other Western powers Britain, France, or whoever uh, helped them. Uh, but we couldn't intervene uh, because if we would have, it would have been World War III, uh, likely. Um, a lot of Hungarians, by the way, uh, were sent to the Soviet Union. I think they still had some gulags. They were sent like a prison or something like that, or some le fled to the West. Like, there's a lot of Hungarians, you know, that came to uh, the United States uh, later. Uh, the actual prime minister of Hungary, which was Emir Nash, uh, was actually in prison and executed uh, by 1958 for being involved uh, in the Hungarian Revolution uh, as well. Uh, another big event that also happened, too, under Eisenhower uh, as well, they had the Suez Crisis uh, that happened at the same time uh, in October of 1956. Uh, that's when Khrushchev was in power. Eisenhower too, uh, and uh, what happened was in what is Egypt, uh, the president of Egypt, Gamal Nasser, uh, decided that he wanted to seize control of the Suez Canal uh, and nationalize it. Uh, this was kind of controversial because, uh, as you know, uh, a long time ago, it was mostly like the, I think the French helped build it with maybe the British and all that, uh, and. So those two countries that helped like build it a long time ago got angry about this. They were kind of concerned that if they took it over, they might prevent certain countries from getting through. And Israel's worried too, that Israel won't be able to use it either. Uh, and so those three states, France, Britain, and the state of Israel, send in military forces. Uh, they attack the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and uh, they actually um, seize control of it and they actually... I think bomb the Suez Canal and take control of it uh, for a short time. Uh, and uh, what happens is um, what occurs to cause this, it almost causes World War III uh, to break out. 
uh, it should be war at three. Uh, and um, the Soviet Union threatened to intervene, like Khrushchev threatened to intervene uh, if the United States didn't tell those other Western powers to withdraw their forces. And that's what basically happened. And what you're going to see later is that the Middle Eastern conflicts, they're going to become like kind of like proxy wars, uh, you know, where the United States is backing one side, the Soviets are backing another. Uh, in like the Arab-Israeli wars, as an example, uh, a lot of the Soviets backed the Arabs. And of course, the United States backed Israel, along with some of the other European powers. And so that's something that you do see a lot, uh, by the way. But they did withdraw, like France, Israel, Britain eventually withdrew their forces, uh, and they avoided uh, the um, like a World War III. But there is something interesting about what happened uh, because the Suez crisis that I did want to mention about, they had what they call the Eisenhower Doctrine that uh, that Eisenhower issued afterwards. Uh, and what it said basically uh, was that if there was a Middle Eastern country that was threatened by a, by a communist type state or communist aggression, uh, they, could, they could seek military aid from the United States. Uh, and it gave the, the president the authority to, you know, to do that. Uh, and so that's something that was, you know, pretty much that helped create these proxy wars, like I said, uh, in, in the Middle East. And uh, so there's a lot of countries that the United States will give military aid to, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, of course, Israel, uh, which we have later. Uh, there's other things, of course, that happened in the Cold War. I uh, did want to mention that happened under Eisenhower. Uh, that's well known. There's, of course, there's Ike right there, famous painting uh, of him, as you see. Uh, one thing that happened that uh, I think shocked a lot of Americans, uh, if you know about this, it's one of the biggest events I think that happened really in the in the whole uh, 1950s was Sputnik. Uh, 1957, I'm talking about. And yes, yeah, Sputnik was a was a major event uh, that shocked us totally. Uh, and um, what happened was the Soviets launched the first satellite into space. Uh, Sputnik 1, I think they called it later, October 4th, 1957. And so you start hearing this like beep, 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 you know, going around the whole, you know, Earth, really there's a thing going around the Earth satellite. They start launching more of those, of course, later. This scared, this scared Americans because of the fact that they realized that now the Soviets could basically uh, launch anything into space, not just a satellite, they could launch an atomic bomb or a nuclear weapon. Uh, so that a lot of people start thinking that the Soviets are more advanced than us uh, in the late 1950s. And so that's part of why they start putting more money uh, into uh, like, like science and other things like that. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie called October Sky. It's a really good movie uh, where they're kind of influenced by Sputnik and all that. That's a really good movie. It's so-called Rocket Boys, I think they were called, that kind of joined NASA later. Uh, and anyway, that's a really good movie. Everyone watch October Sky, which is kind of about that period. Uh, and um, But they do think that the uh, launching of Sputnik is a famous. It, it actually helped to start what they call the space race, you know, uh, between the uh, United States and the, and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, so you get that get that being incurred. And, of course, the Soviets, you know, they start launching, you know, animals and people in the space. They have that dog Laika. Laika, I think, was the first animal in space that they launched uh, that was very famous, the dog Laika. And then they put the first man in the space, of course, which was Yuri Gagarin uh, in 1961. Um, so they, they did that. I think they were the first also to um, – to actually like go into space, like with a space suit or something like that uh, as well. Spacewalk or whatever they call that when you go outside the spacecraft. They did that too. So they did a lot of things first that we didn't do, uh, the Soviet Union uh, as well. Uh, what happened because of Sputnik, uh, it forced Eisenhower to create NASA, which is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. You can see created in 1958 which was done for the space program, also for the missile program uh, as well, because uh, we need to develop like nuclear missiles and satellites and things like that in space, uh, like the Soviets. 
And so we did the same thing. We began to launch, you know, satellites in the space as well. Werner von Braun, who, you know, was ex-Nazi, <laughs> was the guy that helped develop the space program. Yeah, a Nazi, believe it or not. Um, I think both of them had some kind of influence on the Nazis because uh, the Nazis, you know, had those V-2 rockets uh, that they had started to use uh, in World War II, which is where a lot of these ideas came from. So you had, like, first of all, Explore One. That was our first satellite. We shot in space uh, in January of 1958. Uh, so you had that. Uh, and then you had the Mercury 7 program uh, that came next, uh, where we began to launch men into space uh, overall. And uh, so that led to actually the first, like 1961, 1962, uh, we had the first American men uh, that went into space that NASA sent up uh, as part of Mercury 7. Uh, we had Alan Shepard. He was the first to go into space in uh, 1961, followed by John Glenn, who was later an American senator, uh, who was the first American to actually orbit the Earth in 1962. Uh, believe it or not, first in space for America was not a man. It was a chimpanzee named Ham. <laughs> they always joke about that. Ham in a can or something like that. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie called The Right Stuff. That's a great movie. By the way, if you want to ever watch it or read, or read the book. There's a book about it, too, as well, which is really great, uh, which talks about the space program. The space program is going to be important because that's going to later lead to the Apollo program where, uh, as you know, they try to put a man on the moon, uh, which will happen eventually uh, when Nixon's president. So uh, that's the bulk of the 1950s, pretty much. Uh, I'll kind of wrap up on Eisenhower, of course, later in the week uh, on Thursday I'll kind of mostly start talking about the 1960s, kind of like the Cold War era part two. I'll kind of get into, so we'll talk about that period. I'll talk about the Kennedy assassination, as you know, that happened in 1963. That's kind of famous uh, as well. So we'll get into that. But before I go, don't forget, remember, you have the second exam. I think that's still out, of course. So make sure you wrap that up by the end of the week. Uh, and then don't forget, you have you know research papers out there. Uh, you can start wrapping those up or turn them in. Uh, or if you, of course, have already turned them in, uh, I think I think last week in one class, I know I had turned them in already, but some of you might be behind on it. But try to get those wrapped up, of course, for me. So anyway, uh, if you all have any questions, comments about this lecture, of course, let me know uh, on my, my, my YouTube channel. I don't think we have any questions today. It looks like it. Uh, in the live stream. Uh, but that's it for today. I'll, of course, be coming back later on Thursday, and we'll talk about, of course, uh, the 1960s. So y'all take care. Have a great rest of the week.